So the Greater Good Science Center is an interdisciplinary research center here at UC Berkeley, those of you who don't know. And we are devoted to the scientific study of happy and compassionate individuals and strong social bonds, such that you might find in families, which is what we're talking about today. And I, um, I think what makes us really unique for a research center here at UC Berkeley is that we are so um, invested in getting the word out about this research to the general public. So um, all of you know that, uh, that Greater Good is our primary um, vehicle for doing that. Um, and so I hope that you all have subscribed and are fans. And if you aren't, um, there is, you're going to remind me of the details, but there is a terrific subscription offer. It's at 20% off of um, an already good, well-priced subscription. So I hope, um, I hope you all subscribe. I am really excited today to um, tell you about our latest initiative uh, to get the word out about this research. You all, all I can see reading these flyers that are on your chair. Just this week, we have launched a whole new website for the center, and um, there's an entire section of the website now dedicated to parents. So I know that there are a lot of um, parents here. This is um, a, a resource center for parents interested in raising happy and emotionally literate children. Um, the, this website was really born out of people asking me as a parent, um, oh, Christine, tell me about that research again, the stuff about praise, how to praise your kids, or do we really have to eat dinner together every night, things like that. So really what it is is a, um, a blog and a video blog series, um, two parents uh, talking, Kelly Corgan, who's a local author, a newspaper columnist, um, and I chatting. So, and there's lots of other great little tidbits on the website uh, for parents as well. So I hope you will check it out. Now, uh, oh, and I would, uh, I would love to thank our co-sponsors, the Journalism School and the Child Study Center as well. So, it's um, All right, so thank you and welcome, and I'll turn it over to Greater Good Managing Editor. Thanks again for coming out on this Wednesday afternoon. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce our panelists in a moment, but first I want to talk a little bit about what motivated this issue of Greater Good Magazine. When I was growing up, and when I was a young adult, and even today, I think it's safe to say that the dominant narrative about the family in our society, and by dominant narrative I mean the one that was, that's embraced by the political party that's held power for most of the past quarter century, as well as large elements of the uh, supposedly opposition party, as well as large elements of the national media, their dominant narrative of the family, I think it's safe to describe as apocalyptic. And this apocalypse, I think, has, has four horsemen. There is the rising divorce rate. There's uh, the decline of the so-called traditional family, that is to say, the, the breadwinning father and the, the homemaking mother. The emergence of new social movements that challenge, like feminism, that challenge the underlying uh, bases of power in our society. And the emergence of non-traditional families, like gay and lesbian families, for example, and the multicultural fragmentation of our ideas about what makes for a good family. And growing up, I saw evidence of this in my life. You know, my parents are divorced, like many of yours. I grew up very far from my grandparents, like many of you. And I never really thought much about it. And I don't think that, um, even though I thought of myself as being progressive and so forth, I don't think I did much in my imagination or in my public life to challenge this. Until, it just wasn't urgent, until I became a parent. And then I discovered two things in addition to how to bathe a newborn and change diapers and all of that stuff. I discovered, first of all, that in fact, it was true. It's very, very hard to be a parent today. It's very difficult. You know, we're raising our kids far from our extended family, but not all of us, but many of us. We're cut off from role models that seem viable to us. And we're having tremendous difficulty today, in, the, in this time, in this place, in the United States, negotiating our work life and our family, the relationship between our work life and family life. So that's half the story. 
The other half of the story I discovered when I went to the playgrounds of San Francisco was that I saw a lot of gay and lesbian parents. I saw a lot of divorced parents. I saw a lot of step families. I saw a lot of fathers taking care of their kids. And it didn't look like an apocalypse. It looked pretty good, actually. And I found that I really enjoyed hanging out with those parents, discovering these families. And in the process, I think, we were all sort of creating new communities. We lost our old community. A lot of people come to San Francisco because they felt like outsiders in you know, Nebraska or wherever they came from. They come here and they're like, cool, I'm an insider. And then they have kids and suddenly they're on the outside again. Um, you know, but we, in, the, in this process, we would build these new communities. And we would also build, I think, new ideals about what is a good parent. And I'll talk about dads because I am a dad and because I'm writing a book about fatherhood. There's a lot of complicated things going on with fatherhood right now. A lot of things happening simultaneously that seem to contradict each other. But for the guys I know, at least, and for the guys I'm talking to and researching my book about reverse traditional families, they don't embrace an image of the father as being the head of the household. They don't see themselves as being authoritarian lawgivers or, bread, or even primary breadwinners. They see themselves as being co-parents. They assume that the man and the woman has equal capacity to contribute to the financial and the emotional health of the family. Now, this doesn't mean that it's utopia. As we all know, there's a huge gap between ideal and practice. And every day you confront that gap. We all do. And there's a lot of problems that arise from egalitarian relationships, such as whose career gets priority when the rubber hits the road. And that's what we were trying to capture in this issue of greater good. We were trying to take a look at the trade-offs involved with family change, and also trying to point to some of the ideals that I think are emerging and a lot of the positive trends that are emerging. And we have here today, I think, probably the four people best qualified in the country uh, to explain the 21st century family to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm not joking. Uh, our first panelist is Stephanie Kuntz, who uh, joins us from Olympia, Washington. She woke up at 3 o'clock this morning to be here, where she teaches history and family studies at the Evergreen State College. And is the author of many books, most recently, Marriage, a History, How Love Conquered Marriage. Uh, and she's going to talk about the historical process that got us here, that created the landscape um, uh, that we're confronting today. Next up are Phil and Carolyn Cowan, and many of you know them. Phil is the former director of the Institute for Human Development here at UC Berkeley, and Carolyn is a professor emerita uh, at UC Berkeley. Together they've conducted a number of studies of family transitions, uh, and, the, and the one that that interests me most, and the one that I wrote about in this issue of Greater Good, is the Becoming a Family Project, where they looked at 200, 200 couples over a 20-year period and watched them become the process of them becoming parents. And that formed the basis of their book, which is on sale in the back, uh, When Partners Become Parents, The Big Life Change for Couples, I believe is the subtitle. And they're going to talk about that. And finally, we have Joshua Coleman, uh, who is a psychotherapist and an author here in the Bay Area. And I really think of Joshua as being on the, on the front lines you know, of, of family change in a lot of ways, somebody like Joshua, because you know, he, I think that his, in his books and uh, in his work as a therapist, he's really preoccupied with people negotiating the interpersonal relationships that are created by this new family landscape, by, by economic and social forces that you can't necessarily control, such as women going to work and what that entails for both fatherhood and motherhood. So I'm really glad to have them here today. Oh, and I should also mention that all four, I believe, are on the, the board of the, the fan, oh, okay. I should also mention that all four are on the board of the Council on, uh, for Contemporary Families, uh, which was a tremendous resource for us uh, in putting this issue together. And maybe we could uh, take a moment to uh, give all of our panelists a big hand.
idea how we got here in, in just 10 minutes, which is all we've been given. But I think that uh, I would like to emphasize that I really do believe, and historians don't tend to say these things lightly, I believe that in the past 35 years, America has been experiencing an interpersonal revolution every bit as wrenching and far-reaching as the transition to wage labor and industrial capitalism 200 years ago. A sweeping rearrangement of gender roles, intergenerational expectations, parenting challenges, work life, even our experience of time and space. And just as the familiar landscape of self-sufficient farming communities became almost recognizable with the Industrial Revolution, and I read the, the diaries of people who came to the cities and could find their way through the forest but were completely lost in the new cities, so uh, we are all having to negotiate new family terrain to pick our way through uncharted uh, territory. We shouldn't idealize the old paths of family life. I've spent uh, most of my career trying to explain that and would be happy to, um, in the question and answer, get uh, to go after some of the myths about some golden age of the past. But at least those paths were familiar and well marked. Whereas today it's easy to look out at the still unimproved paths that we're beginning to uh, have to, to follow and wonder if, if somebody, if, if of either ourselves or somebody else in our family or some other family I noticed right over there hasn't taken a wrong turn. But my argument in the brief time I have is that while some of these new paths are tougher to negotiate, they also open up new horizons. And we need to wrap our mind around the difficult paradox that most of the problems we face in parenting, uh, in marriage and in parenting today, are the flip side of gains that we've made. Uh, and if we tried to get rid of all the uncertainties and the difficulties, we might well end up losing the gains we've made. So now I have to gallop through both marriage and parenting to make a little bit of that case. Um, let's take the changing role of marriage. Um, and the new challenges involved. You know, for more than a, most people don't, I think, realize how really new the idea is that people should love and respect each other in marriage and negotiate things. For more than a thousand years, marriage was the main way of securing advantageous social networks, consolidating business deals, raising capital, the dowry that a woman brought right up, right up until the end of the 18th century was more important than the daughter herself, uh, even sealing treaties and military alliances. In the lower classes, it was a way of finding a work partner and expanding the family labor force. It was, you know, it was the, the kind of marriage where in some societies, uh, love was seen as incompatible with marriage. In other ways, and others, for example, our own, it was considered to be something that should develop after marriage, but certainly it was not considered a good reason to get married in the first place. It was only about 150 years ago with the ideals of the Enlightenment and the American Revolution, the radical idea of the pursuit of happiness, that parents and state began to relinquish control over who could and could not marry, and it became respectable and even desirable to, to marry for love. And incidentally, defenders of the traditional marriage of the day, social conservatives of the time, predicted disaster. If you let people marry for love, the wrong people are going to get married. You're not going, they're going to demand, the, you know, now we worry about gays and lesbians, you know, saying, oh, well, God, we have a right. Then they worried about poor people. Um, the people aren't going to marry the right person. People are going to demand the right to stay single. Uh, if they if, if they haven't found someone they love. They predicted, basically the social conservatives predicted that love would be the death of marriage. And you know, they weren't completely off base. <laughs> but for the first uh, 150 years of this marital regime, uh, it was held in place by um, the you know, by the, the subordination of women, legal as well as economic the lack of birth control, the harsh penalties for illegitimacy, and incidentally, every society that has had a very stable institution of marriage has done so on the basis of having a very harsh institution of illegitimacy. Um, so gradually, really only in the 20th century with the breakdown of gender stereotypes, did marriage become to be based on 
love, mutual fidelity, and mutual respect. And even then, for the first, I would say, 60 years of this new marital regime, it was women who had to do the emotional work. We tend to think of women as the romantic sex. In fact, it was men who embraced the love revolution first. Right up until 1967, a uh, college poll showed that, that only 5% of men, but two-thirds of women said they would uh, uh, consider marrying someone they didn't love if he met all their other criteria. So women had to be practical, they had to be quiet, they had to make the accommodations, uh, wear your, you know, the pop songs that I grew up on, wear your hair just for him, do the things he likes to do. Um, let your uh, ladies home journal for whom you know I am now a marriage consultant uh, wrote advice books saying you know let your husband wear uh, win at cards uh, ask him to explain something to you in the nightly news um, <laughs> uh, when one guy even suggested that you fray a lamp cords or, or so that just to give hubby the satisfaction of knowing how helpless you'd be with oh this doesn't work honey <laughs> Structural conditions that created these kind of rules have changed. Of course, the biggest, um, the many things contributed to it, including the abolition of, of illegitimacy, uh, allowing people to avoid shotgun marriages if they wanted. But the biggest has been the transformation in the economic and legal options for women. You know, most people don't realize this, but right up until the 1970s, most states had head and master laws. And until the 1980s, they defined the duties of marriage in totally non-reciprocal ways. It was the man's duty to support the family. The wife didn't have that duty, even if they, uh, if, if they needed the money. It was the woman's duty to keep the house, raise the kids, and provide sex, which is why marital rape was uh, uh, considered a contradiction in terms until the 1980s. All this has been turned on its head just in the last 35 years. Then on top of this has been actually a reversal of a much shorter uh, historical trend but one that became predominant in the 1950s and 60s, and that is the idea of the male breadwinner family. So we're not only having to negotiate new marriages based for the first time, really, on, le on, on, on equal legal and economic options, but we're having to forge new families in a situation where most couples uh, are male, they do not, no longer have male breadwinner families. And yet, at the same time, our social policies are total out of sync with that. You know, our school schedules are set up in the time when you needed your kids home to help with the milk, milking. Our work schedules are completely out of sync, both with uh, childcare and school and with kids' body clocks, by the way. Our childcare is, as you know, just totally inadequate, uh, an international disgrace, and our family leave policies um, it would be an insult to the Neanderthals to say that they were that far out of date. So all of this has changed all the rules about who marries, who divorces, what keeps a marriage together, uh, and we're having to renegotiate that, and I don't have time to talk about it, but hopefully the others will, because I'm also asked to talk a little bit about the challenges of how these have changed, the challenges of parenting. Now, one of the big myths that we have today is that there are more uninvolved and irresponsible parents than in the past. Most of you probably know the new studies that show that American parents are spending more time with their kids than ever before in history. Um, and they're investing more in their kids than ever before in history. In fact, uh, a third of all the money that you will spend on your child will happen, according to Frank Furstenberg and his colleagues, after your child turns 18. So they're, 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 we're being asked to spend a longer period of life investing in our kids. Uh, and we are doing much better with our kids. But there are real reasons for tension. Um, first of all, because uh, not because kids have lost uh, access to parental, to, to parental support, but because they've had, they've lost access to so much support from outside the family, to so much community support. Children's economic, you know, we talk a lot about the destruction of childhood, but in many ways there's been an extension of childhood as kids have been stuck longer and longer in age-segregated uh, institutions. Their economic dependence on their parents has been lengthened. Uh, making adolescence this extended holding space 
in a society where you cannot any longer pretend that there aren't more interesting things going on in the world around them. So parents are being asked to do more. Uh, they're, they're more responsible for teaching their kids mores and values and setting limits on their behavior than ever before. At the same time as old community kinds of uh, mentoring and older uh, uh, neighbors and work patterns, especially for boys, where kids were taught these, were socialized by older men on the job rather than by parents at home. Uh, that's a recipe for conflict and it makes um, in the line between the kind of under-protection and under-supervision of kids that puts them at risk and the over-protection and over-superstition that drives them away narrower than ever before. Parents are walking constantly fearing that they're gonna fall off that line. And it's been worsened in the last 30 years by what some economists have called the, the new winner-take-all society or the development of the, the hollowing out, an hourglass kind of economy where there are more options for people to make it into the, in, into, to succeed in ways that were never even conceived of before. For the first time ever, the top 20% of the population now owns 50% of the income. Uh, they, have they have access to services and resources that were once reserved for a tiny sliver of the rich. It's an amazing world of opportunity out there if you can make it up into that top 20%. At the same time, if you fall below it, you have further to fall. There are fewer jobs that pay a living wage. Um, living wage, And so parents are constantly pressured, not only to be good parents, teach them all these mores, teach them all of these good things, but also to prepare them for, to succeed in an information economy and are constantly feeling this pressure to make every moment a teachable moment with some uh, tensions that I think Again, the other speakers will talk about. So I need to end. I got my two-minute warning two minutes ago. Uh, although I could have obviously gone on uh, and would have liked to go on a little longer. Uh, but I want to just end by making the point that these are social and structural dilemmas. Some families negotiate them more successfully than others, some less. We can, as the other speakers will talk about, help people to negotiate them more successfully. But one important way of doing that is to help them understand that the problems lie in the social situation often, not in the individual psyche. And so I just want to end with, with one of my grandmothers. You know, people take texts, remember? You know, I, I grew up in the period when the great civil rights leaders always started with a text. Well, uh, my, one of my favorite texts today is a saying from my own family. Uh, my grandmother used to say that, you know, problems are often opportunities in work clothes, but if you won't invite them in because of the way they're dressed, you're never going to find out. And that, I think, is the way we have to approach this instead of wallowing in nostalgia for the past. Thanks very much. I'm going to follow Stephanie's amazing summary of centuries of family change um, by talking a little bit about some of its implications. Carol and I will do that. Along with what you've heard about the changes in marriage and parenting, my message is going to be how connected those two things are, and I'll get to that in a minute. Along with the changing values and the changing expectations, we have different pictures now about how family relationships ought to play out. Fathers are more involved or are expected to be more involved. Couples are expected to be more egalitarian. But we don't have any good models of really how that works. And we don't have any support from government and business in most areas of society because they're still set up to support the old version of family, not the new version. Now, some in the recent government have suggested that what we really need to do is change our family values back to the old ways. And if that would work, it would be great because it wouldn't cost anything, which seems to be, I think, the aim of that kind of policy. What I'm going to try and show is that it is going to cost something. Families need a lot more support than they're getting. <clears throat> so each individual, each couple, comes home left to figure out how to manage this 
relationship as a couple, this relationship as a family, the balance between family and work on their own. They come home tired, they feel guilty about being, well, partners are usually working, they feel guilty about being away from their child, they spend quality time with the child, they put the child to bed for two or three hours, they fall asleep with the children. They don't have any time for themselves, and they don't have any time for the couple relationship. And again, there's no external supports for this. There's no things of family leave, paid leave, governor just vetoed an extension of family leave, and it's still being fought out state by state. There's no good and affordable child care so that parents would feel better about leaving their children when they have to do so. Everyone suffers, the kids, the women, and the men, and Jeremy says it's a really hard time. It's a really hard time to bring up families these days. Now, the focus, so, so what's required? The focus that we've seen in our studies of five or 600 families so far is that the focus has been on parenting. We want to be the best parents we can be. And there's guidebooks in all the stores, you know, in the bookstores, but of course they're contradictory guidebooks. Different people say different things. Our results in three studies and then hundreds of other studies say this. Sure, the quality of your relationship with your child is important, but the relationship between the parents is equally important. When parents, and I'm talking about heterosexual parents, gay and lesbian parents, divorced parents, all kinds of parents, mothers and grandmothers, when the people parenting the child are at each other's throats and can't resolve problems, their parenting is compromised, and hundreds of studies say kids are not doing well. They're not doing well academically. They're not doing well with their peers. And the same thing is true when you have this kind of cold, frosty, not talking kind of relationship. So in both cases, it poses a difficulty for the child. So one of the things, yes, we should be worried about the instabilities due to divorce, but we need to be equally worried about what happens when, with families when the co-parents don't get along with each other. Other factors in, in children's well-being are pretty obvious. Um, we, we have trouble selecting the patterns from the, gener from the families we grew up in that we don't want to continue, and then we find ourselves continuing them. And we need to take a look at our own personal, emotional distress, because that affects kids. And uh, Jeremy really points out in, in his article in The Greater Good how important the surrounding community and the support for families can be in maintaining a good environment for the child. So, so what do we have to do? And I'm not talking about a kind of me generation, everything from the parents. But if we're really convinced about the, the idea that the well-being of children is important, we need to try and do five things. We need to reduce parents' level of anxiety and depression. That is, it's not just parenting. It's not just being a good parent. Parents have to take care of themselves. They have to work on or enhance or improve their couple relationship, learn how to negotiate. Most of us don't have good models of how to negotiate. We, um, they, they need, we need a more rational way of trying to select the patterns from the families who grew up in that we do and don't want to continue. Yes, we need to increase our parenting skills, but we also need to increase community connections. Now, that's not going to happen if we just change our values. There aren't supports for families to do this. Carolyn is going to talk about one possible approach to dealing with some of these issues. I'm going to talk very briefly um, about three projects in which we've been working with couples more preventively before the parents or children were hurting so much that they felt they needed help from mental health professionals. I'll tell you a tiny bit about how we worked with the couples and summarize what we found as we followed almost 500 couples over the early family making years in three different studies. Based on our personal strain as a couple with three growing children in the late 1960s, and on what we were seeing in families who were coming, for example, to the psychology clinic here at UC Berkeley for help with their children's problems, Phil and I became concerned with what we saw as a gap in thinking about family problems. 
parents, and Phil has alluded to this, parents seem to be putting all their energy into nurturing their children's development, and no one seemed to be taking care of the relationship between the parents. As we watched many marriages come apart at the seams, it became clear to us that we were not the only ones feeling stressed, although nobody was talking about the strain in their marriage. We developed the idea of working with couples before their stress had taken hold and their problems felt totally insurmountable. Because it seemed as if many of these strains were particularly troubling for parents of young children, we designed our first project, the Becoming a Family Project, for ordinary couples who were about to have a first baby, and we recruited couples from all around the Bay Area. We randomly invited some of those expectant couples to meet with us every week in small groups with clinically trained leaders for the six months surrounding their transition to parenthood, that is, the last three months of pregnancy and the first three months of parenthood, with the babies coming into the groups as soon as they were born, which did change the character of what we could do in the evening. We randomly invited other couples in the study to tell us about their experiences of becoming parents by filling out questionnaires and talking to us regularly in interviews over the next few years, but as our control group, they were not offered these ongoing couples groups. We followed up with all 96 couples regularly over the next six years. We talked to the parents and the children. We later videotaped all of the families in several different situations. Parents playing and working with their child on a challenging task in our family playroom. The whole family working and playing together in another piece of a visit. And in a separate visit, the parents working alone as a couple while they tried to work on making some progress on an unresolved problem they were having. We compared the changes in all the families in that study over their first six years as a family with or without the intervention. Let me say a tiny bit about the nature of the couples groups we've been conducting because they were very similar in all three projects. Each group has a male-female leader couple and five couples uh, who are participating. When we focus, what we focus on in the groups and in our before and after questionnaires and interviews is how, a lot of the things Phil was talking about. How the parents are doing as individuals, as parents with their kids, how they're doing as couples, what kinds of models they're bringing from their early relationships with their own parents, because we believe that all these contribute to how the parents and children will manage the challenges of their lives. So each week, the leaders focus the participants' attention on one or two of these aspects of their lives. We work with them on their disagreements and impasses, the family work struggles that uh, so many of them have. We help to recognize and bolster their strengths as individuals and as couples, um, and uh, try to hold them to their dreams so they don't lose them. And we offer encouragement for making small shifts in how they operate that sometimes have big payoffs. Basically, we're trying to help them be the kinds of partners and parents they really want to be. And these are almost all, in the beginning, families who aren't coming asking for help. Um, Josh is going to talk about what happens when families know that they're in difficulty and he tries to work with them. Uh, in the Becoming a Family project, this first project, there were a number of benefits for the mothers and fathers who worked with us in these ongoing groups. But for now, I'll just mention one, um, and you'll see the theme in the other projects. For the couples in the control group, Marital satisfaction and adjustment declined over the six years between their baby's births and, their and the children's transition to elementary school. By contrast, for the men and women who'd worked with us in these couples groups over six months, their marital satisfaction and adjustment remained stable over those six years. In the second study, the School Children and Their Families Project, we recruited another 100 couples uh, from around the Bay Area, and they all had a first child about to make the transition to elementary school. So we started here a little before the last study left off. Again, to some couples randomly selected, we offered a couples group meeting every week, this time for 16 weeks, so for four months we met every week, around the child's transition to school time. To the other couples in the study, we offered a brief consultation with the same project staff and we followed all 100 families systematically when the children were in kindergarten, first grade, fourth grade, ninth grade, and we just finished following them at the end of 11th grade in high school. In this project, too, the couples in the control group declined in marital and, uh, adjustment and satisfaction over those 10 years from age 4 to 14 of the kids. Um, but the satisfaction of the couples who worked with us in the 16-week couples groups remained stable over 10 years. These are quite new results. 
The parents from the ongoing groups were also more effective at helping their children when they got stuck on a challenging problem, and many of them also became more effective at working on their unresolved problems as a couple. One exciting result from that study, which is the longest one we've done so far, uh, supports the theories that we've been discussing in that the children of the parents who took part in these ongoing couples groups had better adaptation to school in kindergarten and again in grades one, four, and nine as they made the transition to high school. They had higher academic achievement, they got along better with other students, and they had fewer acting out aggressive behavior problems and fewer withdrawn, depressed uh, problems according to their teachers who didn't know which children in their class were in our study. These first two studies focused on working class and middle class families, that's mostly who responded, and they were both funded by the National Institute of Mental Health Prevention Section. Now, Phil and I are working with low income families in five California counties in a third study funded by the State of California's Office of Child Abuse Prevention. They asked us, and our colleagues, uh, Marsha Klein Pruitt and Kyle Pruitt, who are in the East, uh, they asked us to design a way of working with low-income fathers that would foster their positive involvement in their children's <coughs> lives. Because, especially in low-income families, dads, the research shows that dads seem to slip away as the children get older. And we think it's often because the relationship between the dad and the mother of the children uh, is, is having some strife or difficulty. We're following up with the first 300 families now, 60 in each of these five counties. Here the parents were randomly offered either a 16-week group for couples, of the kind I've been talking about, or a 16-week group for fathers, with exactly the same content. Or our control group here was a one-time meeting in which we gathered some parents together, these were all randomly assigned, uh, and talked about the importance of fathers to their children's development. Um, and then we follow them all over time to see what happens. In this study, again, the intervention parents' satisfaction with their couple relationship has stayed stable for the first uh, two years of the study, while again in the control group, the satisfaction of those parents as a couple declined. The fathers became more involved in the day-to-day -day care of their children, and both parents in the, from the couples groups and the fathers groups are reporting less depression, less anxiety, and less parenting stress than they had before the project began. Because we want to get to discussion with you, um, let me end by saying that one bottom line message, there's obviously lots more detail we could talk about from these three family studies and many others, is that when parents get help to work on their issues as individuals, as parents, and as couples, as they're struggling with them, Many of them end up with stronger relationships as couples, more effective parenting strategies, and um, what we hope will happen in the third study as well, their children do better as they adapt to the challenges of school and relationships with other children. Although we know this is really hard work for parents to do when they have so much else going on, we tend to suggest to parents that they think of taking care of their couple relationship for the sake of their children. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I want to thank Greater Good Magazine and the School of Journalism for sponsoring this event and for uh, Jeremy for moderating it. I'm especially honored to be on the same panel as Stephanie and Phil and Carolyn and long been an admirer of their writing and research. You know, sometimes there's a, there's a disparity between what um, we clinicians are seeing in our office and what researchers and, and uh, academics are writing about, but in this case, there's actually quite a bit of congruity a little further, okay, sorry, a little too, too much, huh? Um, and that is, there, there's a lot of congruity, and that is that it's both an exciting time to be a couple and a family, and it's also a tough time to be a couple and a family. It's an exciting time because today, more than ever, people can tailor their individual relationships in terms of their sexualities, their ideals about balancing work and family life, their ideals about parenting, their personal preferences about who they want in a, in a partner in terms of their personality, et cetera. And it's a tough time because it's actually really hard to balance work and family life. And we also don't know exactly what we're getting into when we get romantically involved with somebody. And there's not a lot of guidelines these days to, to have a relationship or a marriage um, 
in, in balancing the ways that we're all trying to do that. So I've been invited to speak on this topic from the perspective of a psychologist in, in private practice who works a lot with, with couples and families. Therefore, my comments will be primarily practical in nature. Uh, the first part of my talk will be about um, couples' relationships and the second part about parenting. So what are some of the ways that couples can promote a good relationship? Well, the first thing to highlight is that it has to be a relationship among equals. In Stephanie's excellent book, Marriage of History, her original subtitle was From Obedience to Intimacy. And I really like that subtitle because it highlighted that there's been a big sea change in what uh, and how we construct a modern day intimate relationship. A modern day relationship has to be a relationship among equals or it's probably not gonna fly. So what are the principles of a relationship among equals? Well, one is that you have to be 100% devoted to your partner's well-being at the same time that you're 100% devoted to your own well-being and happiness. It's a lot like having a good sex life. I mean, we psychologists really do try to boil everything down to sex. Um, <laughs> and that is that if you're only interested in your own needs and happiness, you're gonna probably bore your partner to tears. And if you're only worried about and preoccupied with your partner's happiness, then you're gonna probably end up feeling resentful and unfulfilled. Well, the same is true to have a modern day relationship. If there's any weakness on either side, if you're either overly devoted to your partner and neglecting your own needs, or you're overly <coughs> devoted to your own needs and neglecting your partner's, your relationship is probably going to founder. The second principle to understand, and this is perhaps the most important principle that I work with with couples, and that is the importance of empathy in relationship. Both people really have to have the capacity to express empathy from both their hearts and their minds. And a key principle of understanding empathy is to understand the separate realities, nature of family life. For every person in the family, there's a separate reality. If you have four family members, there's four separate realities. If you've got two family members, there's two separate realities. And the reason that this is important is that when couples come into to therapy, what they're really wanting me as a couples therapist to do is to be kind of an arbiter, a judge and a jury, and you know, weigh down with who's right and who's wrong, and I couldn't be less interested in that. Why? Because it doesn't really solve anything. What really solves things is for each person to have the capacity to really get into the heart and the mind of why their, per their partner feels the way that they do. So let me take a real life example from my practice and I'll camouflage some of the details to, for, for confidentiality. So Ron was a stay at home father of two, married to Mary who was an attorney. She was the sole breadwinner of the family. They came into couples therapy because Mary felt chronically unappreciated by Ron, and Ron felt chronic, chronically angry at Mary. As, it, as we got into the couples therapy, it turned out that Mary would come home from work, and she would complain about her job. And she was really just decompressing, you know, as, as many of us do. She came home from work, she complained about people in the office, some of her tough cases, and that kind of thing. But when she did that, Ron heard that as a complaint on, about him and his masculinity. He took it as an assault on his masculinity and the fact that he wasn't earning any money, even though he was completely wrong. And so in response to her taking that stance, he would respond by, because he felt defensive and shamed and humiliated by that, he would respond by being very aggressive and criticizing her. Um, and so um, she would just end up feeling hurt, unappreciated and undervalued. And so she'd respond either by withdrawing or by getting mad back at him. So it really wasn't until this dynamic was brought out and they were really able to empathize with each other that there was a shift that, that went on in the relationship. Another important principle to understand, and um, Phil and Carolyn have done a lot of really important research in this regard, and that is to understand the effect that your family of origin has on your relationship. You know, there's all this interesting data now that um, so many couples say that they're egalitarian before they have children, that they're gonna share childcare and housekeeping equally, and then once the kids come along, suddenly the traditional roles kind of rear up. Well, that's not only true of traditional roles around gender identity, it's also true about a whole host of things, that when people have children, when they become really intimate, somehow it brings to the fore a lot of the unconscious conflict that happened in their families. So if you grew up in a family where there was ongoing verbal abuse, physical abuse, shame, humiliation, either between the parents or from the parents to you, there's a very high probability that that is gonna come out in your marriage or your relationship and be problematic. You know, Freud once said that in every marriage there's um, 
there's four other people in the bedroom. Uh, there's the, the parents of the one person of the couple, and there's the parents of the other person of the couple, which uh, if you knew much about my in-laws or my parents, you'd find that image as troubling as I do. But, um, <laughs> but he was really on to something very, very important. Um, finally, my recommendation for couples, and, and this was is really brought, up, brought out by Phil and Carolyn's research, and that is that you have to have a date night. Guess how many couples have date nights when they come in to, to see me in my office as a regular thing? Zero. Zero. I have yet to have a couple come in, and when I say, um, so tell me what you guys do on your date nights, I do it paradoxically, because I know they're going to say we don't have one. Um, nobody says, uh, nobody says, oh, our regular date night is Saturday night. Why? For precisely the reasons that have been talked about. They're worried about the children primarily. And, um, and that brings me to my second part of the talk, and that is the sea change in parenting attitudes that have occurred in the 20th century and have continued unabated into the current century, particularly in the last few decades, as, as Stephanie has observed. Um, that we've gone from a view of children as being fundamentally robust and strong and resilient and with the idea that stress and competition and that kind of thing would actually be character building and strengthening to seeing children as being very fragile and vulnerable and frail and needing what one author referred to as a kind of hothouse parenting where every little, every little need and anxiety and aspiration has to be very closely tended to and nurtured and, and, and worried over. And it's a big problem because what's happened is that there's been an enormous transfer of emotional resources um, in the past few decades in particular from extended family and kin and the neighborhood and communities all sucked up into the nuclear family and been redistributed in most cases to the children. And in many ways that's good news for children and it's also bad news for children. The second aspect of parenting that I want to highlight is the change in what parents expect from their children. That if you look at parenting surveys that were done in the 1920s, what parents wanted from their children was they wanted their respect, if not their fear. They wanted them to respect um, outside authority, and they wanted their conformity. What today's parents want from their children is their love and their admiration. They want them to be individuals, and they want them to be autonomous. So there's been a huge shift um, from an autocratic family system to a much more democratic family system. Um, but it's also softened and weakened the boundaries between parents and children. So there's much more, there's a, a much grayer area about um, who's in charge in the household. Most parents that I talk to have, um, they're really worried about what is really a, um, a hurtful versus a helpful application of parental authority. So I would like to reserve my final comments on the topic of parenting adult children. Um, partly because um, it's the topic of my new book, When Parents Hurt. Um, but, but more importantly, because I think that there's been a sea change also in parenting adult children, partially because what's been talked about, it's um, it becoming much longer to be an adult. I think because of that, children are extending the kind of rebellious behavior that was once reserved for, from the sort of 13 to 18 year set is being extended out into the 20s. So parents are often very, very confused about how to parent adult children. So the following recommendations are with that in mind. Um, the first is, once a child has grown and, and becomes a parent themselves, don't criticize their parenting. Um, secondly, don't criticize their spouse or their partner. I get letters every day from parents, oh, my kids cut me off, why? Well, because I told them I didn't like their spouse. It's like, okay, well, that's why they cut you off. Um, don't try to get them to spend time with you by guilt tripping them. Um, it's, a, it's a common technique, but today's adult children, we've all raised our kids to be immune to guilt, so it's not going to suddenly start working once they're grown up. <laughs> if you're unfortunate enough to have a kid that cuts you off um, or complains about you, then you want to stay in the game and you want to don't accept that as kind of the, the end game. Um, Try to find the kernel of truth in terms of what their complaints are about you. Again, um, invoke the separate realities principle that it's possible that you really were a good parent from an objective standpoint and, um, and felt like a good parent, but you also missed something important about them. Try to not come from the perspective that, you know, gee, I did the best that I could, so you're so ungrateful for, for not appreciating me. Really try to see it from their perspective. If you did flow it as a parent and you made mistakes, try to just take the hit be honest about it, 
you know, just, just speak to that without being very defensive. It's very, very hard to do. So you, you'll probably need a lot of support, but it's really important to do. Work to forgive your child for whatever ways that they were a disappointment to you or made you feel bad as a parent or a person. Um, forgive yourself for whatever ways that you feel like you let yourself down as a parent and let your children down. Also very, very hard. And finally, if your adult, adult child cuts you up, try to see it as the beginning of a conversation and not the end. Thank you. There's an awful lot of um, evidence that very, very early experiences which parents have control over. I mean, let's just not uh, say, well, there's nothing I could have done, so it's not important. It is important, and there's things you could have done, and there's things you can do for your next child, and there's things we can do as a society. Uh, just uh, drugs in birth are have there's evidence that they cut down quite a bit on the attachment of the mother and the baby. Uh, of course, breastfeeding is very closely tied to attachment between the mother and the baby and so forth. <clears throat> uh, now, we are successful parents in this room for the most part, so we say, well, we overcame it, uh, and then we go on to the next topic. Well, a lot of people didn't overcome those early hits. Uh, they're getting worse and worse. The obstetrical world is kind of getting more and more um, alienating for early, <coughs> excuse me, early families. And I think that it behooves us to uh, pay a lot of attention to that. It, it sets the course. It, it makes it a lot more difficult uh, for, for parents to love their kids when the hormones of love, which nature provides for us, don't happen because of drugs and so forth. Um, also, I happen to be uh, a big supporter of co-sleeping and other kinds of attachment parenting behaviors, which uh, evidence is showing, help parents do a better job without having to think about it. If you've slept next to your kid all night, you just know them better. You just love them more um, in you have some less sex, basic that's the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> What's that? I didn't. Hear you. I said, yeah, but you have less sex. That's the <laughs> oh, um, I, there's no evidence for that. <laughs> I say that as a co-sleeping parent. Does anybody have a response uh, to what she just said? We do, uh, we do, uh, is this on, yeah. We do work on attachment, so uh, I think that attachment all the way through the lifespan from the cradle to the grave is extremely important. But I'm going to take a kind of contrarian position to yours a little bit, and that is that the evidence that I'm aware of from Berkeley and everywhere else is, yes, if you had to bet on is there a connection between kids doing well early and kids growing up, there's a connection. But there are so many exceptions. There are so many changes. There are so many unpredictabilities that kids go up and down depending on the circumstances throughout your lives that I'm very reluctant to say about any one practice short of abuse where there's long-term negative effects, that there's any one practice that we can say, this is what we have to do. I don't think the end. Sure, Having a warm relationship with your child is good, but I don't think that there's one particular practice in parenting that you could say, if we have this down when the child is an infant, that we know that the kid's going to grow up well. I, I, I would just like to add to that as a historian who studied the extraordinary variety of child practices that have worked and not worked through history. And one of my passions uh, is that we have to open the opportunities for people to, to have, I mean, we are only one of the only countries in the world, uh, in the industrial world, that doesn't allow breastfeeding breaks, for example, at work. That's, that's terrible. We should open those opportunities. But I want to, I just feel passionately that in this world of changing options, 
that we don't tell parents there's a make or break thing. There's lots of ways to love your children and develop warm attachments. So I think it's very important for us to open those ways up, not to make people feel further guilt if they can't or won't do that exactly one practice. Yes, I'm an attorney and mediator, and I see a lot of couples in conflict. And one of the trends that I'd like to hear you comment on, when Professor Kunz talked about the dark side of the positive trends, is what, what I would call the, the narcissism of the individual as sort of the dark side of the liberation of the empowerment, whether you want to call it ask meets feminism meets the left, or whatever you want to call it, a sense of my way or the highway that creates an inflexibility among parents, with or without children, but especially with children, that makes these dissolutions so difficult for the children, and how that sort of emergence of individuality has come into conflict with the notion of family as a place where you don't always get your own way. I'd like to speak to that. Um, there was a recent study by Jean Twinge, I forget which university she's at, but she interviewed um, um, several thousand college students and concluded that today's college students are some 30 to 40 percent more narcissistic than prior college, college students of several decades before. I, I'm sure she didn't pull anybody you know, at UC Berkeley. Uh, but, uh, it is one of my concerns about this hothouse parenting that we are, we may be raising, that, that there's both the good news and the bad news. The good news is that I think that children are getting a kind of a A plus kind of parenting from parents who are very, very concerned about their well-being. And for some kids, that's really the right thing. But there are a certain percentage of children that are going into the world with an expectation that the world is going to be equally forgiving of their foibles and embracing of their talents, which, I mean, if you just look at American Idol, you can sort of tell that um, there are many parents out there who are willing to even put the kid into the lion pit to support their, their, their aspirations and their talents. So I think I, this is something that I actually am a little bit concerned about. Concern about um, labeling people as narcissistic. I, one of the things that we're trying to do in the work we do is to make partners more aware, more conscious of what it is that pushes their buttons and where that upset or distress might be coming from. Um, there are some very many, many, many uh, well-educated. Um, really competent people who have some very primary needs that weren't necessarily taken care of earlier in their life, and they're not always aware of how that plays out in their relationships with their partners or with their children. Um, so I know that by the time they get to you and they're separating or divorcing and things are feeling rancorous, uh, people can sense, it's like the rest of us who wake up in the middle of the night in the middle of a fight and sound more like children than like grown-ups. Mm -hmm. uh, the news from our studies of ordinary people is a lot of this stuff happens to a lot of people, only most people don't talk about it. Um, so uh, let's be a little bit careful about what we call narcissistic and let's appreciate a little more what might be driving some of this behavior that in the end is not a these either to the partners as a couple or to their children. I, I have a reputation among my students of being the least into any kind of self-esteem uh, <laughs> praise that, that of the faculty members at Evergreen. But I want to say one other thing. Uh, and that is that often your most bitter divorces come from people who have sacrificed. It's that fine line. You know, sometimes the people who have sacrificed the most silently, but who've been tallying up the gratitude sheet all those years are the ones who really blow at a divorce. And that's why I think we've all been emphasizing here this fine line between you know, what, as Josh said, meeting your needs as an individual and meeting your partner's needs. Um, I have a question. Um, the, it seems like the, the focus on marriage as this romantic, amazing, beautiful institution 
occurred during a severing of other bonds in society and that you could almost consider it a symbolic repository of all those bonds and expectations into a single institution. Well now it seems like everyone's talking about how the energy and focus of society is shifting to children. And so I'm wondering if you guys see that as a response to any sort of loss in society. Um, first question, and then the follow-up to that is that when marriage had those increased expectations, it became a less stable institution. So if there are increased expectations on the parent-child bond, do you see any signs of it destabilizing? Well, of course, that's the second question is exactly what Josh was talking about, you know, this tremendous expectations uh, of love, uh, you know, of, of them to be autonomous individuals, but also to love us and be grateful to us and admire us. Uh, that's, that is some of the same destabilization that happens in marriage. And yes, indeed, um, you know, sometimes people say to me, oh, well, let's tamp down our expectations of marriage. And having studied 4,000 years of low expectation marriage, I would say that's a really bad advice, and it's almost <laughs> always directed at women. But I certainly think we should raise our expectations of other relationships. And I do think that that has what has been really being um, gradually and actually with some acceleration in the last 20 years um, become a problem. Married couples used to be the social center of a, a community. They did build social capital. They were the ones who intervened in sometimes too much but also helped out uh, unmarried people. They organized social occasions. Today, Naomi Gerstel and uh, Natalia Sarkisian, if I think if that's how you pronounce, have um, pointed out that what they find is that married couples are less likely than singles to give practical support, not just to friends and neighbors, but also even to parents. It's often the unmarried sibling who does more for the parent. And um, we've also seen this, this a study out of the University of Arizona and Duke that shows over the last 20 years, more people say that they discuss important matters with their spouse than in the past, and I think that's a good thing. But on the other hand, the number of people who say they only discuss them with their spouse has doubled. Which means, of course, that if the spousal relationship goes south, <laughs> you've got nobody at all. And so I think that tendency to try and find all satisfactions in either the marriage or the parent-child relationship has indeed caused a lot of the problems that um, our therapists here, who know much more about this than me, have been talking about. I think that um, part of what I worry about, along the lines of what you're talking about, is that the, the, the change has been described as parents' overinvestment or increased investment in kids. And there are two points I want to make about one, investment's an interesting word. Um, it, it implies that there's a payoff at the end, and I'm worried about what parents think the payoff uh, is going to be. The other point, I just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, well, oh yes, it's, it's that I feel awkward being up here and trying to make an argument that parents ought to pull back a little bit. It's not nice, it's not politically correct. I'm not saying abandon your children. In, in, in American parlance, you either do this or you do that. There's nothing ever about balance, maybe a little more balance. So I think that unless there is a little bit more balance in the parent-child relationship, that it does run the risk of a destabilizing of those kind of relationships down the line. I think that high expectations are problem these days with marriage that and there was a study that was done uh, that showed that if you come into marriage with really lofty expectations about what the marriage is going to provide for you 
Um, and I am a little concerned that when people get married today that they do think it's going to be a central wellspring of their happiness, it's going to be a personal platform for their, their growth. Um, I do think people sometimes come into marriage with somewhat un unrealistic expectations of that. And there was a study done that showed that if you get, come into marriage with very, very lofty ideals about what you're going to get out of your marriage, if you're actually more divorce prone and you're more unhappiness prone later. So um, that's just my thought on that topic. My question's about the role of culture and, sorry, uh, as we've seen increasing numbers of cross-cultural marriages, how, do, how does the reconcil reconciliation of uh, cultural values play out in the kids? I'll just start, it's, it's not a full answer to, to a response to what you're saying, but one of the most interesting things that we saw in these couples groups that we've been doing over the years is that there were quite a number of interracial couples in some of these groups. And when uh, a particular couple who were from different um, backgrounds were having a difficulty, they attributed it totally to the fact that they were from different backgrounds. Whereas other people in the group, in the room, who were from so-called the same background would say, we, we have that issue absolutely just exactly. So sometimes it's a little bit hard to tease out what's, what's the culture and what's um, the nature of two people coming from slightly different places. Um, how it plays out with the kids, I think um, kids are terribly observant. In our study, we interviewed the children when they were four and five and six with a puppet interview that was created uh, in, in our project. And um, they can tell us the most, the most amazing things. And um, they, will, they will ferret out it's things. It's Rudy Giuliani's wife. She has something to say about it. They'll ferret out um, you know, tone of voice and as, as well as actual message uh, when their parents are tense. Uh, and what we learned was that when parents fight a lot overtly and have sort of noisy conflict, the kids say their parents fight a lot. And when parents have these frosty, I'm not talking to you, I'm so upset with you kinds of interactions, their young children also say their parents fight a lot. So it's not totally responsive to the, the culture thing, but it is a very interesting um, aspect that kids do pick up on in many ways. Um, in talking about the 21st century family, I think we might have spent a little bit too much time focused on parenting and couples, because to me, you know, the demographics show, not only in this country, but in Europe also, that there's been a declining birth rate, that more people, both singles and couples, don't have children. And if you don't have a child, does that mean you don't have family? I don't think so. I think it really increases the extended family networks, the importance of siblings and aunts and uncles and, and so forth. Also, we haven't talked about the increasing amount of the life cycle that people spend single, both before marriage, after divorce, in widowhood, and you know, and then a slight increase in those people who never marry. So um, that's a new reality, right? Where people are not living in couples, but I don't think I still think they have families. They certainly have families of origin. They have often adult children, they have sisters and aunts and uncles, etc. So to me, um, that's another reality um, of uh, 20th, 21st century families that hasn't been captured, particularly by the last three speakers, in terms of what the 21st century family means. And uh, you know, I'd be happy to hear other people's you know, comments on that. Um, to, one thing in response to that, I mean, absolutely, there are, there are more people not having children, but the vast majority of people still do at some time in their life. So, I mean, it's way over 50%, 60, 70, 80. Um, okay, so that's still, this is a big chunk and it's increasing. The second thing is about single, people who are single. I really think that the discussions of that are really inadequate because most single people, especially single people raising children, 
are connected with somebody who's also co-raising the children. So single is a misnomer that the census says these people are single. They're not sing They're not single. They're not married. Well, with, I, with one person, but they may be still co-parenting. They're co-parenting. They're co-parenting with their own parents. They're co-parenting with friends. Yeah. We need we need to take more of a systemic rather than a demographic look at that phenomenon. I'm not arguing that it's not there. I'm saying that it's actually much more connected, but we don't know who it's connected with than we think. I just add, you know, it's, I think that that's a very important point, that marriage no longer organizes the life course. It's no, the possession of a marriage license is no longer a good marker for whether someone has incurred interpersonal obligations. Uh, and just as legally we have to recognize that there are many important relationships that occur outside of marriage, so emotionally, and this gets us back to your question, we have to recognize that there are many other important relationships other than cohabiting or marriage or even romantic. That, and I think we need to find emotional and legal ways of recognizing and validating those connections. Um, I've been studying uh, lesbian parenting for some time and uh, uh, marriage. And so I just want to say that I'm really grateful to uh, all of you for being here. It's great to hear this. I have two questions that are kind of distinctly different from one another. The first question has to do with couples. It does seem to me that certainly in the Bay Area, men are becoming more nurturing, kind of becoming more maternal. And um, you know, it's clear that there's more and more of a focus on obsessive parenting, what you'd call hothouse parenting, less attention to the couple. So I'm wondering, uh, for my first question, does that mean there's less sex happening today? I'd be interested to hear what you all think about that. Um, and if there's less sex, is there less marital satisfaction? Um, so that's one question. And um, it's a very confusing topic to me because, for example, uh, lesbian couples, it's often talked about, have less sex. But on the other hand, they've got a lot of marital satisfaction in the studies done so far because uh, the bio biological mothers feel a lot of um, uh, support from the second parents. They don't feel alone. So that's one question. Then the other question is, um, in terms of the research around uh, kids of lesbians, the, the research really has focused, it's been driven by the courts and what are the concerns by mainstream America about kids being raised by lesbians. And so they focused on three areas, gender roles, um, you know, which essentially is like fear that they're gonna be queer, the kids too, um, socio-emotional development of the kids, and then uh, social and peer relationships. And you know, are those kids normal or not? Well, yes, we're finding out that they're, you know, they're pretty much the same as anybody else. Um, a friend of mine who's helping to work on a transgender conference coming up called me and said, was I familiar with any data about the impact on children of uh, non-traditional parents, um, the impact on them of societal prejudice against their parents? And I, I thought, what a great question. I thought, well, no, there's, I'm not familiar with any studies like that because you know, who would be concerned about that? So, those are my two questions. Thank you. Uh, do you know? Is there less sex? Is there less sex? Do you know? I don't have any statistics. Um, anecdotally, I can certainly say that there is. Um, I would say that just about every, I'm not talking about myself. Um, <laughs> Anecdotally from my practice, please. Um, I would say just about every guy that comes into my practice complains about it, particularly um, when they when couples become parents. But I don't have any statistics about it from this. But from a practitioner's perspective, I would certainly say yes to the first question. 
I, I have a little bit of data about that uh, in, in Alone Together, uh, which is a new book from four Penn State uh, sociologists that compared uh, a lot of things, but one of them was marital satisfaction in 1980 versus couples in 2000. I think uh, satisfaction with their sex lives dropped about four points. I don't know what that means. Well, you, you have to, as a historian, you have to be so careful about that. You know, what does it mean when people say happiness, you know, is lower today than it was in the 70s, when interviews literally heard, had women saying, we have a happy marriage who doesn't hit me. You know, I mean, what, we have, we live in a highly sexualized culture where sex is more important, you know, in some ways to people. So I, I don't think it's an answerable question. I don't think there's data on it. There's, um, and I don't know the data on, now one very interesting thing in terms of the impact when people are marginalized, I don't know the data on the um, impact, and I'm not sure that we have enough data in terms of gay and lesbian or especially transgender parents. But you know, sometimes these things um, being teased because of your parents can be a positive thing. I came, you know, my dad was a union organizer back in the 50s when that could get you uh, in trouble with McCarthyism, and I uh, experienced that sort of marginalization as one of the, I believe now it was one of the things that gave me more tremendous strength in, in my life. It was one of the real positives is having had to defend my family. Uh, anecdotally, what we found when we, we followed the first couples from becoming a family project, and we would come back after three or four years after the baby was born and say, well, a lot of couples experience a lot of change in their sex lives. What about you? And they would say, what sex lives? <laughs> Not everybody, but it is, again, impressionistically that, especially in these early child rearing, early career forming, those are together, times that, that there is. But I, it, it's really interesting that we don't know the answer. I don't know that there's any good um, sex research, and certainly the government has done everything possible to prevent it. <laughs> Not, no, 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 seriously, the, the prevent research data, gathering data on sex. Um, the uh, kids of lesbian parents, that I, I know that you probably know this, but Judy Stacy and Tim Biblards have written a terrific review of some of these studies, and their suggestion of, of studies of kids Part of their argument is that the kids of gay and lesbian parents actually are doing as well or a little bit better than, than parents of heterosexual. And you've got to figure into that that they've been subjected to prejudice. So either in spite of, or Stephanie was saying because of, some of the opposition from outside, it, it, it hasn't resulted in wholesale uh, maladjustment of these kids. I uh, completely support that conclusion, but just because at the Council on Every Families we try to be really, really fair-minded about things, we, most of those samples come from convenience samples, and the people who volunteer for those are likely to be better parents. So, you know, the story's not complete again. But I, I'm pretty sure uh, the, the, the evidence is that it's at least neutral, if not positive in some ways. Well, the other positive may occur is that because gay and lesbian couples have to go through more hurdles to become parents, they, they, it shows a greater commitment to the marriage. It's not as likely they're going to be pregnant on a whim, uh, which would be a big stabilizing force in the marriage, so it could be a big factor as well. Okay, so we, we have time for one, maybe two more questions. I know you've had your hand up for a while, um, but please try to keep it brief so maybe we can squeeze in one more after this. Um, I'm not sure about how satisfied all the couples were in your studies to begin with, but that the couples who received the intervention were more stable over time. Um, I guess I'm just curious what you guys think that means about people's love choices and, um, and how we should be supporting people's love choices in their marriage or the couples they're in. And, and we you know what that means for intervention. And I, I'm, I come from a child welfare background where there are these kind of marriage initiatives being pushed down from the federal government in welfare. And you know, usually I cringe when I hear them. But then when you guys are talking about you know having these interventions that are helping families. So I'm just curious in your thoughts of your thoughts on that. Well, um, I know there's a lot of concern about um, push 
from the federal government um, with these initiatives that first came out um, saying that they wanted to promote marriage because the research was showing they said, they claimed that children of married parents do better in general or have fewer problems than children of um, single parents. But um, I, to just put in um, a little piece of information from our experience, Phil's and my experience, at consulting with one of the big projects that, that did receive funding, has received funding from um, one of these initiatives. Um, this particular project happens, it's, so it's from this marriage money, but this particular project actually is directed at low-income uh, couples who are married and one of the, and there is another project um, headed by Mathematica, which is a, a research institute, um, and this one is headed by MDRC, which is another research institute. But the studies are being designed to see whether intervening with those families a little bit in the style of what we talked about will make any difference to them over the long run because they're going to randomly offer it to some and not others. And the idea is to strengthen the relationships as couples in both married and non-married families and to follow them over time to see whether that makes any difference to how they parents do as individuals, how they do in their couple relationships, whether the intervention actually helps um, shore them up and um, make better, more satisfying relationships and in the long run, whether it actually helps their kids' development. But it's going to be quite a while until we see. So I think I'm jumping more on the idea that you were referring to this sort of pushing, pushing this idea of marriage to say that there are these several projects that we're aware of that are being very thoughtfully designed. They're not designed by the government, but they're funded by the Administration for Children and Families. And we may learn quite a bit about the answer to your question, but it'll be, it'll be a few years till we know. Um, quick from Um <clears throat> This is a question for the Cowans. I'm wondering about the uh, groups, the couples groups, and were you able to tease out the factors in the groups that were um, you know, contributed to the positive outcomes of the couple. And in particular, I was wondering about that because of a few questions back, there was talk about the, um, the greater responsibility that is now on the nuclear family, perhaps a lessening of, of extended family supports and social support. So I was wondering if that was perhaps one of the factors. Um, yes. Um, we don't have the kind of data where we looked at the groups and says this and this in the group leads to good outcomes. But we do have a lot of talking with these hundreds of couples and the single most thing that they tell us is we learned that we were not alone. That we were going through similar things and as a matter of fact we were doing even a little bit better than some of these other people. So, which you don't usually know. You don't sit down with people you know and, and talk about uh, difficulties that you have. You don't usually do that. So we think that social support is inadequate to summarize this, but the notion of providing a context for we're all going through a transition together, we're all in the same boat, contrasting it with society which is isolating us. I think is one of the biggest things. Well, that's the first step. And then, I mean, we're working on this question. We really, really are trying to look at the data that we have over many years to see if we can figure out what's doing the work. But um, if we can get parents, partners, to feel, thank God I'm not the only one, which is exactly what they say, then we think with um, people with especially people with clinical training, can help them say, okay, so now, given the stuff that you are contending with, how can we help you move a little more in the direction that you intended to go, the kind of parent or partner you wanted to be, uh, because their guard is down, they're not feeling quite so defensive. So it's, there's a lot of different processes, I think, that might be accounting for it. Um, I remember one couple who said to us in a follow-up interview, it's probably six years after their initial group when their first baby was born, you remember how we told you how we just were so scared of 
any conflict and fighting coming out and how we just shoved it under the rug. Well, you know what we discovered after working in the group and then all those years, you know, it comes out anyway. So we're trying to find ways to deal with it a little more when it's happening, not to be so frightened and so on. So there's, there are things like that that for ordinary people can help just broaden their notion of what's normal in families, what they don't have to be quite so ashamed of or afraid of, and then what they, the, what they want to do about the stuff that gets in their way. Yeah, I think one of the big perks of being a couples therapist is you really get to see kind of what the range of normal is. So whenever I've had problems in the past between my wife and I, I could say, well, that's, that's normal. Um, <laughs> but, um, I think the power of groups really can be, um, it's, 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 it's so powerful. I, at, at my um, website, I have um, parents writing in on the basis of my new book, and these are parents who've been cut off by their adult children and their grandchildren, and they all say the same thing, thank God I'm not alone. And they all felt alone. They all felt like I was the only person who had this. And I'm just very impressed by the power of community and how strong it is. That's a good note to end on. Thank you very much for coming out. I have a handout on the back in case any of you are interested, just based on the topics that I talked about, so it's on the book table. Yep, we got stuff on sale in the back. Go there. Thank you.